Thanks so much, Teresa, and friends, all of whom I know are in the teaching professions, all of whom have to do with what is most valuable to our society, which is learning and the love of learning. When I was asked to come up with a topic um, or a title for this uh, speech, I said, I really think, you know, if we're going to talk about reading, I will talk about my own passion for it. So I said that life without reading is like a life without love. And love is a very interesting concept in the context of this. Uh, there's a movie on right now called Amour, which you haven't, if you haven't seen, I heartily recommend you to see it, because it's very much more complex than you would think when you first hear about it. It's about an older couple. Something happens to one of them, and what happens to both of them as a result of that health problem. But I thought about it in terms of the name, the word amour and the word love was really about something between two people, which in a couple is their thing between them, that love between two people, and that that love is something that nobody else has any real access to, nor do they have any business having access to it. And when I was thinking about my relationship to books, I guess that's what I feel too that I love my books, and I love what I read. And I should just say this is a love story when I talk to you about books, because I've had a love affair with books all my life, and it's private between me and the books. And probably all of us can remember that delicious feeling when we first realized that books were the most important things of our lives besides some special human beings. Sometimes we know exactly how old we were, right where we sat or lay when we became so passionately involved. For me, there were two places. One was on the dock of our cottage. The other place was at the, on the bottom half of a bunk bed in an apartment we shared, my family had, and in the room I shared with my older brother and reading with a flashlight. Growing up as an immigrant child in Ottawa in the 40s, the public library was central to my life. And that's where I found books. We had some books at home, and my parents were very anxious for us to know everything. So they bought from, yes, it's true, a traveling salesman, the 13th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> and I loved that. I can still see it, dark maroon and the gold lettering. Later, they joined the Book of the Month Club, too, because they thought my brother didn't read enough. I read too much, according to them, and he read not enough, so we then got the Book of the Month Club. But I read the encyclopedia with great interest, and it was, it was fabulous to be able to turn up and read theatrical makeup, and I would learn how people were able to change the color of their hair and the color of their skin, all with makeup. And then when I discovered <clears throat> that books were written about separate subjects, I was about seven years old, I guess, and I discovered the real magic of reading. But it was through the library that that happened, and it was in the library that the love affair was consummated. I discovered it all on my own because the public library was between my home and the public school to which I walked every day, which was 10 blocks away, and those halcyon years, nobody ever thought of driving you to school, mainly because we didn't have a car. Uh, nor did any of my friends have a car. But people forget now that Canada was not, in the 40s and 50s, a rich country. Cars were not something that everybody had. And they certainly, nobody would ever have thought of saying, gee, it's cold out. I think you'd better, we'd better send you to school in a taxi or something like that. You just walk to school, only wrapped up more. And certainly Ottawa was pretty cold. And each of us, there were a group of four or five of us that went to the same school and lived within a block of each other. We'd pick each other up at different houses, and I would always be fighting off two boys, Alan and David, who actually are still alive and whom I used to have lunch occasionally with when I was back in Ottawa as Governor General. And they would come and torture my dog by throwing, <coughs> throwing snowballs at him over the fence. And then I would peel off with them. And 
every week I would leave them at the library on the way home. And that was when I learned the meaning of the great Hebrew saying, hold the book in your hand and you are at the pilgrim at the gate of a new city. I was at that gate so often that I was allowed the free range of my school's library um, because I was known as a bookworm who was terrible at baseball. And I wasn't picked, so I didn't have to go out and do that at the uh, recess in the afternoon. And I became a great denizen of Ottawa's main municipal branch. Beautiful library, the Carnegie Library in Ottawa, corner of Laurier, <coughs> excuse me, and Metcalf, uh, with grand steps and columns at the top of it, like a Greek temple. The grandest of buildings, except for the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. And right beside it was what they called the Girls and Boys House, a little tiny Victorian brick house with smelled wonderfully of old paper. That's a unique smell that you don't get to smell very much anymore. It housed all the children's collection, and I spent hours there after school opening the books and inhaling the divine fragrance. No one in the future is ever going to know what that's like because books don't smell like that. This is acid-free paper now. And then I'd make my choice of six books for the next two weeks. And that was always, for me, the wonderful moment. I used to pass the library twice a day, but I would only go once every two weeks and take back the books. And in the summertime, I was allowed to take twice as many, especially when we went away for our holidays. But at Kent Street Public School, I got in discussion about my love of, my, of the books, because there were also books, a few books, not that many, uh, in, the public li in the library at school. And Miss Stevenson was wonderful. She was a librarian who also taught us rhythmic dance, which we performed in small white muslin togas, which had been supplied by the school. The spirit of Isadora Duncan ruled over us. I was 11, and we talked about all the things I was reading and wanting to read. And one day she said, Adrian, I'm going to give you a book confidentially. You are to read it without telling anybody else that I have given it to you. Then you can just tell me what you think of it, and we can have a discussion. So I was a pilgrim to a mar marvelous and secret world, and what freedom. The book was Jane Eyre. <laughs> 